Hello and welcome to another episode of What's Up Prof. Martin, why are we talking about Laodicea again? Because it's probably part of the end time message. Oh, and you haven't asked me how I am. Um, just before I get into trouble, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm struggling with Laodicea. Yeah. <laughs> me too okay okay so that's how i am as well <laughs> so you're also struggling yeah man this is something that i think everybody you either misunderstand it or you don't want to apply it okay. somewhere all right now we've got a very funny backdrop here mm -hmm. what's going on here well this is our walk to heaven and who has to walk in front of us? Jesus has to walk in front of us. But he's on the path. Yes. Why are these people on the left and the right? Why are they not straight behind him? That's exactly what's happening. We've got a message to bring the world. And the way to bring it is in the middle path where Jesus walks. Okay. Where he brings justice and mercy together. Uh -huh. And once we So we walk, have justice on the one side and mercy on the other side? Maybe that's how it, I think that's a very good portrayal of it. Or still on, you, you still think you're on the path because you're following Jesus, but you're on the left, so you're on the mercy side and saying, oh, you know what, Jesus knows my heart. And you know certain descriptions, right? There yeah, yeah. are certain descriptions. Mm. It's like in politics, they don't say the right and the left. Yeah. They said the far right. <laughs> it's true. And the far true. left. The far left. And, and then you have the left, and then you have the right. And where's the middle? There, mm. there is no middle. It's only far left far. or right or far left or far right. And hurricanes too. <laughs> they, they're not hurricanes anymore. Now they are super storms. Yeah. And they're not moving. They're barreling. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's all the, in the description. Hyperbolic. Is that the word? That's right. Yeah. Yes. It's all in the description. And you're not a little bit old and doddery. You're totally demented and gone <laughs> from this world. So, you know, the world is, is very inclined to live in the extremes. Yes. And unfortunately, it's crept into the church as well. So yes. now... What is the Laodicean Testament? It's for a specific group. Yes, it's for a specific group. And uh, if it applies to you, then uh, you will look for a thousand excuses as to why it doesn't apply to you. Mm. It must apply to the other guy. Uh, to him? And if it applies to me, it's on my terms. I want to do it like this. I don't think it's like this. Okay. But there's, it's a straight testimony. All right. So, Barton, are you telling me that we must come up to the testimony of the word and not have the testimony of the word come down to our oh, understanding? Exactly. We have to go up. Come a little higher. Okay. So. I think we must pray we about that. We must pray that. because of this. <laughs> I think we must pray. Heavenly Father, you've put so many gems in the Bible and you've given us such straight testimony. But the way that we use it is not always as to your liking. So help us to, to know how to do it and help us to deliberate on exactly what you meant for us by it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Martin, humanity is very inclined to say, even if all, I won't. <laughs> sounds like Peter, yes. Yes, that sounds like Peter, right? And we say, if we'd lived then, we wouldn't have. Oh, for sure. We not realizing that we already have. The fact that Jesus died on the cross mm -hmm. for sin classifies me as a sinner and as a crucifier. Yeah. So there's no way I can sidestep it and say, not I. No. Even if there was no one else, it would have been me. Yeah. It's my fault. It's my fault. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a tough call. No. It, it touches human pride. Oh, for sure. And <clears throat> there's, it started with Adam and Eve. So human pride is, is inside of you, even if you don't think so. Where did pride start? Well, with Lucifer in heaven. All right. So is, is pride curable? Yes. 
Yes. Yes, it is. But there's only one recipe, right? Yep. Unfortunately, there's only one recipe. Mm -hmm. And the recipe is death to self. Yeah, yeah. Now, is sure. everybody very cheerful to accept that recipe? No. No, rather death to everyone else, yes. right? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this is a this is such a tricky subject because uh, when you read the testimony, then you always want to say, oh, "Fortunately, that doesn't apply." Uh, we we always want to exclude ourselves from everything. Yes, like for instance, if I come to think of it, like the Pharisee that prayed and said, "Thank goodness I'm not like the publican." Yes, we never look at ourselves. We no. always want to see that somebody else. Has to change. But he left the temple self justified. Yeah. Oh, but yeah. totally unjustified. <laughs> wow, that's a very good statement. Yeah. Yes. Self justified, but tot not in God's eyes. Yes, but by wow. comparison, it seemed, seemed to him like that. Yeah. yeah. All right, so we must be careful of the lefts and the rights. We should be in the middle. But there's one other important point. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. Mm -hmm. So what they were exalting in their extremity, in their extreme ways, was not necessarily wrong. Oh, exactly. That's exactly true. But they should have practiced mercy and kindness and gentleness and not bring in the condemnation. It's like the Pharisees. Jesus said, do as they say, not as they do. That's almost the same. So it's not that it's bad to have that testimony. No. It's not bad to strive for perfection. No. But uh, if you want to go to the opposite extreme, then it becomes your enemy. That's the problem. And you become a fanatic and a whatever yeah, yeah. terminology they apply. You see, when Jesus goes into the city... On that path, you can only follow if you're behind him, right behind him. You're going to bump into that side wall over there. You're not going to get in if you are on one of the on sides of him. You have to be on, be behind him. Yes, and if both of them go in together, yeah. you could have a collision. Yeah. Uh, I, <laughs> I have a very naughty disposition sometimes. Yeah. And I've told the story before, but I can tell it again. I was at the university, and at my university, there were some very militant people and some very feministic people. And I was walking with a colleague of mine towards the Senate building. We were going to a meeting. Mm. And when we got to the door, it was a lady uh, colleague, I stepped back and let her go first. I got such an earful. She lambasted me from one side of the other from being, you know, patriarchal, chauvinistic. <laughs> oh. How dare I? Because there was no such thing as, you know, letting the ladies go first. And it must have been a couple of months later, by chance, I was again walking with a colleague. And we were coming through the same door. And I thought to myself, now, what am I going to do? And I decided, I'm walking next to her, I'll just carry on walking next to her. Well, the inevitable happened. <laughs> we came to the door and couldn't go in side by side. <laughs> and both of us Quammed against the side. Now, I was expecting it, but she wasn't. <laughs> now, what was she expecting? Me to let her go first? <clears throat> no, because she had lambasted me before. So I remembered that. But she never said a word. <laughs> she just pushed her way through, and we carried on walking. And I, and I wondered about this for quite a while. I said, but, you know, this, this doesn't work. No. There's no courtesy. There's nothing left anymore. So that's how weird you get. You go, boom, exactly. in the door. <laughs> and that's when, uh, that will happen whenever you take something and that becomes your norm. Or yeah. you, you, you get too hung up on something. True. 
Well, mm -hmm. let's have a look and see where this takes us. The remnant. Well, they say the remnant started with Seth right through the ages till today to the end of time. Actually, it actually started with Adam, right? Yes, with Adam actually already. But then it should have gone to probably Abel. through Abel. Yeah. But Abel was murdered. So what are the criteria to qualify as a remnant? Have they always been the same? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. And the conditions that we find in the Bible are keep the commandments and have the faith of Jesus or the testimony of Jesus. We find that in Revelation 12, 17, Revelation 14, 12, Revelation 22, 14. And there's always a remnant, right? You did a, a short chronology of the line that Jesus was in and that Satan completely always try to get rid of that line. Well, you see, the Redeemer had been promised. Mm. And obviously had been promised through a particular succession, right? Mm. And he would come amongst his people. So these must be people that acknowledge him. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the devil knew that. And so when Cain slew Abel, he thought he'd gotten rid of the line. Mm. But then he miscalculated with Seth. Yeah. I didn't get rid of him. So he finally managed to get virtually all of humanity on his side. Mm -hmm. And God permitted this to carry on until only Noah was left. Yeah. And his three sons. Now... If that's the line leading to Christ, if that line had come to an end, could the Messiah have come? No. No. So how long did God actually wait before he destroyed the line that would refuse salvation for all humanity? Well, till the flood. Till the flood. And he wiped them all out. Mm. And people say, that's a mean God. Mm. What a mean God. I mean, wiping out all of humanity and keeping one family alive. Yeah. That's disgusting, right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Cain was very angry about this plan of salvation. I mean, one little mistake, and, he was, and his parents were thrown out of the Garden of Eden, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And he wasn't going to follow this kind of logic. He had a, he had a problem with God's dealings yeah. with humanity. And, and God waited until all of humanity was virtually apostate. How great were Noah and his sons? No, not very great. Noah was walking close to God, but... Was he very, faultless? No. Did he get drunk? Yes. <laughs> so he was perfect... Because the Bible says he was perfect yes. in his walk with God, yeah. but he wasn't sinless. He wasn't sinless. All right. So there was only one family left. If God hadn't intervened at that moment, all of humanity would have been lost yeah. for all eternity because the only way to be saved is through the line of the Messiah. But now, if you take that same line and you apply it to the remnant, it's exactly the same. Because through Seth, through Adam and Eve, the requirement to be the remnant never changed. Yes. It must, you keep to the commandments and have the testimony of Jesus. So Noah was the remnant. Yes. And Seth was but the remnant. Satan kept on gunning for the messianic line. Yes. So if he saw someone was following Christ or was following God, and he saw it, whether it was Gideon or whoever it was, he would go for their lineage. Yeah. Didn't he try and kill all his sons? All of it. And you go to the kings and they kill all the sons and they kill all the sons and they kill all the sons. And every time one escapes, he always misses Seth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he goes for the others. Yeah. And uh, it must be hard for him to decide because even Samuel... Mm couldn't figure out who was the, the one through whom the line would go, right? Yeah. He thought, wow, this firstborn, he looks, he looks great, so this must be the one, right? <laughs> no, 
Well, then this one. What about this one? No. <laughs> what about that one? No. Then it ends up with David. And that line. So he must have been exceedingly upset about the line of David, right? And that's why also the dragon was wroth with the remnant of her seed. All right. Now, if you want to know what he was wroth about, mm -hmm. there's a definition there. Who? Keep. The commandments mm -hmm. and have the, the testimony. testimony of Jesus. That's it. Those are the two criteria, and he hates them. Yeah. So he's wrath. He'll try and destroy them. So finally, he missed the line yeah. because he didn't think of Mary, no. who was from the line also. of David. Uh, least of all, he thought about Joseph, who was also from the line but wasn't the actual father. Yeah. But God in his mercy saw to it that both of them were from the line of David. So in his panic, what did he decide? Get rid of all the, all the babies. babies. All the male babies. Yeah. Just get rid of them. Why not the female babies? <laughs> because then the line wasn't there. The Messiah wouldn't yeah. come that way. So he'd been gunning for it all the time. So then yeah, Jesus escaped with his parents to Egypt. Yeah came back when those kings were no longer ruling, and uh, there was trouble from the beginning, right? Yeah. How many times did they try and pick up stones and kill him? Oh, numerous times. And finally they, they did. did. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, that was their death warrant. Exactly. That really put the nail in the coffin for them. To, to say. So whoever followed Jesus behind him, was his target then. Exactly. So the disciples, did he gun for them? Oh, and his number one is to get rid of them. Get rid of them. Mm -hmm. Or change the mission of the Messiah. Mm. Yes. If he could only do that, if he can change the mission. Yeah, yeah. If he can get you to just step off the path a little bit. Yes, if he could get you to covet that kingly power mm -hmm. that he covered. Mm -hmm. But uh, that... To heck with the humility stuff. We don't want that, right? <laughs> we are too important for that. If he could only do that, mm -hmm. but he couldn't. So now he has to go for the remnant. Yeah. Whoever follows behind, that's the one he will go for. Mm. He's not so worried about the ones on the left and the ones on the right. No, no. They were in, in the church in those days. They were the Pharisees and they were probably the liberals as well. For sure. Yes. So we have this, this problem here of this battle that takes place in the following of Jesus. Yeah. So let's look at the Laodiceans testimony. I saw that the testimony to the Laodiceans applied to God's people at the present time. Well, it has to because it's the very last one. Yes. There's a last church. The Laodicean church yes. is the last church after that, there's no church anymore. And the reason it has not accomplished a greater work is because of the hardness of their hearts. But God has given the message time to do its work. The heart must be purified from sins which have so long shut Jesus out. The fearful message will do its work. All right, Martin, let's think about that. Shut him out. Hmm. In other words, what is it that you don't want from him? Well, his rules. And his humility. Exactly. They're both. Of, so you, and sometimes you accept the one and don't accept the other. All right. So who rebels against Jesus? Self. Yes, for sure. Self. Yeah. So the only thing that's keeping him out is self. Mm. Because if you let him in, you have to surrender something. Completely. There's nothing of yourself you can keep when you want to surrender. Now, is that in line with human thinking? No. We've got human rights. We've now had a, a big sports series again. You know, you had the European uh, football matches going on, and you had the same thing in the South Americas. And it seems to me there has to be a lot of distraction at the moment. Yeah. And then you have Wimbledon going on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and the Olympics is on its way, I think. And the Olympics is on its way, and they're preparing for that. And 
when you see the pictures of those that either scored a goal mm. or those that just won a match at Wimbledon, what do those people look like? Do they say, I'm so grateful for the talents that God has given me? Do you hear that? Anything but. No, you have these mouths that are wide open that could swallow a whole swarm of flies at the same time. You have the fist punching in the air. Mm -hmm. You have this, uh, I'm the greatest, mm -hmm. I beat this guy into a pulp. Yeah. Or they make a nasty comment. Exactly. Like if somebody has to leave because he just lost, well, enjoy the flight home. <laughs> you know, something like that. It's, 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 so it's, it's all human pride, isn't it? Yeah. Completely. I mean, if you even want to go to the political sphere, it's completely self-absorbed. All right. If you take the, the, the debate between Biden and, and um, Trump, how much of I did this was in there? How much kindness towards oh, the other one? Zero. <laughs> zero, right? <laughs> Let's not go there yeah. because the point is human pride stands in the way of humility. Absolutely. And so human pride shuts out Jesus because that has to die because pride is the very cause of the origin of sin. Yeah. Yes. Selfishness mm -hmm. and pride, isn't it? Well, yeah. Okay. So that's the only thing that shuts Jesus out. And it's a very, very sad state of affairs because if you want to come back into harmony with the principles of heaven then you must open the door. Mm -hmm. Because he's knocking. He's, he's not going to open it. He's not going to force his way mm -hmm. in. He's not even going to open the door to peep in and say, hello, no. are you willing to let me in? You have to open the door. You have to say, okay, I'm willing to die Yeah. to this selfish individual that I am. Mm -hmm. But as they failed to see the powerful work accomplished in a short time, many lost the effect of the message. I saw that this message would not accomplish its work in a few short months. It was designed to arouse the people of God to discover to them their backslidings and lead to zealous repentance, that they might be favored with the presence of Jesus and be fitted for the loud cry of, the third angel. All right, Martin, why would you backslide? What does backsliding mean? I would, I would like to say that when you backslide, you are placing yourself back into prominence and that which you held to before, you are making secondary. Yeah, that's a very good... Jesus was mm -hmm. probably the front and you were continuing and then he started getting a little bit less because there were other things that... And self started creeping in. Mm. And you could say the same with, uh, with issues, let's say sport. Yeah. Was sport creeping in again and then once you take mm. part in that, then you have to exalt yourself. Mm. It's just one of the symptoms. So backsliding can take place on a spiritual level can take place on a physical level. You can start indulging in those things that you enjoyed in the past. Mm. And, oh, it is not so serious. It's not so bad. It's only a little fruit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's good to look at and it tastes good, for good food. too. All yeah. Right? All right, so they were backsliding. And it would take time for this message to work. Why would it take time? Because the, the battle. Yeah, there's a battle, and your heart has to change. Okay. I saw that God would prove his people. Patiently, Jesus bears with them and does not spew them out of his mouth in a moment. Yes, so such he's a long suffering. He's long suffering. Look. All right, so only by persistently saying, I won't, will you eventually have to be spewed out. Hmm. But he doesn't want to. No. no, why not? Because he died for you, right? Yeah. So God leads his people on step by step. He brings them up to different points which are calculated to manifest what is in the heart. Some endure at one point, but fall off at the next. 
At every advanced point, the heart is tested and tried a little closer. If the professed people of God find their hearts opposed to the straight work of God, it should convince them that they have a work to do to overcome or be spewed out of the mouth of the Lord. Is that logical? So if you don't, yeah, well, if you don't like what God says in his Bible, then exactly this will happen. You have to then, you have to come in line with him. He's not going to get in line with you. All right. So Martin, if Christ is perfect and I am imperfect, then the only one that needs to change is me. Yeah. That's it. Is it, is it hard to realize that you are imperfect? Yes. Eh? It is because it, it fights against your humanity. Okay. But individuals are tested and proved a length of time to see if they will sacrifice their idols and heed the counsel of the true witness. If they will not be purified through obeying the truth and overcome their selfishness, their pride, and evil passions, the angels of God have their charge. They are joined to their idols. Let them alone. That's a biblical voice. Yeah. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him go. There's nothing more that God can do then. That's a spewing out. Yes. He's actually letting you go. Yeah. He's actually... Not retributive, he's actually leaving you to your will. And that is how who God is. Yes. He if you he's not standing there, oh you're gonna and with a with a rod. No, no he's he always just, knocking. Yeah, and he says, That's your choice. Okay. So what are the idols that you can be attached to? Oh money, uh entertainment, food, food. Drink? Yeah. Anything. Anything that's... Licentiousness? Ex oh. Media? Yeah. Movies? Mm -hmm. Tear jerkers? Music? Music. Martin, that's a lot of idols. Yeah. Anything that you put above God. Okay. And uh, there's also a generational... Oh. Uh, equation in that, you know, music might be more effective for young people of keeping you out of the kingdom. But I know of some adults who won't let it go either. Oh, for sure. I know of evangelists mm. who for the sake of music went back into the world. Mm -hmm. That's rather sad, huh? That's exactly any idol. For being able to let your fingers go. Yeah. There you go. Leave there you everything. go. Because you can't do that yeah. anymore. So is the church depriving you of a talent? Yeah. That's what, what the, um, the thinking is. Yes, the thinking is. Or, the same with sport. <clears throat> yes. Oh, you, they're not allowed to do anything on the Sabbath. I so. could have played at the national level, yeah. for example, mm. right? Now they're depriving me of that. Yes. Of your God-given talent. That's yeah. the one that they put yeah, on so, front of you. So God is, you know, he's a hard taskmaster. Isn't it bad how they use it? They say your God-given talent, you, uh, you have to use your God-given talent to do what God does not want you to do. That's <laughs> so true. <laughs> all right. So basically at the bottom of it all, there's pride. Yeah, that's it. Okay. So you have to choose between God and being elected to a national team. Pride has nothing to do with no. it, eh? No, it's <laughs> it has everything to do with it. I don't know how people can't understand that. All right, but it's hard for people to understand it because is. I've been indoctrinated. So when they pass on to their work, leaving them with their evil trays unsubdued to the control of evil angels. Those who come up to every point and stand every test and overcome be the price what it may, have heeded the counsel of the true witness, and they will be filled with the latter rain for translation. Now, in this world, it seems as though you're constantly having to give up. Yes, G give in and give up. I have to sacrifice something. But in terms of the world to come, isn't that you gain, you gain, you gain? The whole time. Eh? So the swap... It's like literally like filthy rags for a robe of righteousness. Yeah. The problem is our focus. Yes. 
the focus is here on the earthly things. Obviously, it feels like you're unjustly treated if you miss out on these things. But if your mindset is in a different place, you, then you can put it into perspective. All right. Now, let's say you uh, sport again. Mm. If you are a superstar in sport, everybody loves you. If you are a superstar with God, the whole heaven and the angelic host love you. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, what's the difference between those two? The one is idolatry and the other one is what? Is acceptance of humility. Yeah. Because when you've given up everything and you're humble, the other one is more important than you. That doesn't work in a boxing ring. <laughs> I can imagine. It? No, you, you eat first. No, you eat first. No, no you eat first. No. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. And how, how are people attached to their idol? For example, let's take a boxing ring. How many people have died in a boxing oh, ring? Numerous. Have many. they given up the sport? No. In, t in fact, now they've actually gone a little bit worse. Now it's not only a boxing, now it's um, MFC, that uh, fighting without gloves and, and stuff and like that. And kickboxing, mm. right? And then so that you can't escape, you put you in a cage. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the old gladiators. Don't they realize that what happened? So have we gone from bad to worse, right? Yeah. We don't learn the lessons. All right. So they're joined to idols. Humanity is basically joined to idols. Here in this world, in these last days, individuals will show what power affects their heart and controls their actions. If it is the power of divine truth it will lead to good works. But if the evil angels control the heart, it will be seen in various ways. The fruit will be selfishness, covetousness, pride, and evil passions. Could evil angels so twist the truth that even particular aspects of the truth become an idol? Yes. That's exactly... Well, they, that's their focus. Mm. Could you become you. such a health reformer... Mm. That health reform becomes an idol over and above the gospel. 100%. Would you then become judgmental? Yes. Would you then become prideful because, look, I've achieved this already. Perfectly. Does that mean that you shouldn't be a health reformer? No. You have to be in the middle. Okay. But that's exactly what happens. And those evil angels are constantly busy doing this. They're trying to use something good like you just mentioned, and be, almost make it an idol. As soon as it's good, it has to be pushed to an extreme. Yeah, that's how they work. Now, Martin, when I say extreme, does that mean you have leeway to sin a little? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, right? This is very complicated complica for some people to, mm. to understand. And I must admit, I struggled with it for a long, long time as well. What, how do you deal with it? It comes to... I think it comes to an attitude All right. uh, on, on this. So be right with yourself, but be exceedingly careful how you tread on those around you. Yes. Some lean upon an old experience they had years ago when when brought down to this heart-searching time when all should have a daily experience they have nothing to relate. They seem to think a profession of the truth will save them. When those sins which God hates are subdued, God will come in and sup with you and you with him. All right, so here's someone now that has accepted the truth. And he lives the truth and he's happy I found the truth. But isn't the truth supposed to work in the heart? Yes. It's supposed to change it something. A, there's a, a transformation that has to happen. All right. So truth in itself mm. doesn't save you. No. <laughs> no. Hate knowledge of it. And, no. and even if you have accepted it intellectually, if it doesn't change the attitude mm. and the heart, then it is a spurious truth. Exactly. Even though it is truth. It must be applied. Okay. You will then draw divine strength from Jesus... And you will grow up in him and be able with holy triumph to say, Blessed be God who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
It would be the more pleasing to the Lord if lukewarm professors of religion had never named his name. That's a real strong statement. All right, so there's another statement where she says that those within the church are often better agents of Satan than those without the church mm. because they're like a decoy. Yeah. <laughs> All right? And maybe we can just put it in there. Is it important for us to realize this at the time where we are living? Okay, so where is this going? We can't just carry on, you know, quoting one here after the other. Where is this going? We are living in a time when the final events are upon us. Mm. We are Laodicea. Yes. Let's just get this straight. That's it. We are Laodicea. Therefore, we need introspection. So when is the time to have introspection? 40 days after the coming of Christ, right? <laughs> no. no. Right now. Right now. Okay. So this testimony <clears throat> applies to us right now. Right now. I was shown that some of the people of God imitate the fashions of the world and are fast losing their peculiar holy character which should distinguish them as God's people. Fashions of the world. Mm. Now, it's not our place to criticize everything. It's to look at the mindset. This testimony, is it written for everybody else or for you? It's written for me. And that's how you should read it. Okay. Okay. Are you happy if the church is filled with youth? Yes. Uh, are you necessarily happy as to how they come dressed to church? Not always. Not always. All right. Now, we could mention each one of those. Yeah. But it's just a symptom. So if you arrive with your torn jeans, because mm -hmm. that's the fashion, and it's good enough for the world, so maybe it should be good enough for God. Or am I going to be a little bit different? Are you going to go with torn jeans to a banquet with the queen? I don't think they're going to let you in. They probably won't <laughs> let you in, right? Yeah. Or an audience with the Pope. <laughs> probably with him, probably it's going to still work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so always think about it in this way. Are we going to be super judgmental and this way or that way? It's a very fine line and it's very hard to understand. It is. It's but a principle. Again, just for me, if you apply it to yourself and you don't check everybody else, then everybody applies it to yourself. Bring the truth rather than the judgment. All right, bring the truth and let the truth do the cutting mm. rather than your words doing the yeah. cutting. Yeah. All right, so the inhabitants of the earth are growing more and more corrupt and the line of distinction must be more plain between them and the Israel of God or the curse which falls upon worldlings will fall upon God's professed people. So obviously the church must look different to the world. <clears throat> they must look different, they must dress different, they must eat different, they must believe different, they must be dedicated, and they must portray the character of Christ. Mm. We see that, right? Mm. No. Not necessarily, right? That's why it's called Laodicea. Okay. <laughs> I was directed to the following scriptures, said the angel... They are to instruct God's people, 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10, in like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. So Martin, you must be a pale duck. Mm. No, that's, that's how it will be interpreted, ex right? That, that's the problem. Now, only in contrast to the world yes. 
would it be a pale duck? Yes. Now, before we came into this church many, many years ago, if I had to think, well, what am I going to get my wife for her birthday or for whatever occasion? Uh, the paintbrushes and the paint box were always a good go-to. That's it. And a nice glittery box as well. Yes. <clears throat> so you go and you pay a fortune for this painter's array. You pack it in a nice package and it is always very well received. Now you get to the point where it says, no, take that away and replace it with uh, shamefacedness, sobriety, not with gold and pearls and costly array and paintbrushes, etc. And for the first time, you actually see what she looks like. <laughs> <laughs> is, is it a shock? If you are still worldly minded, yes. All right, but what if you make that switch of mind? Then it becomes beautiful. And then the other becomes artificial. Mm -hmm. And you think to yourself, but why do they look like that? Mm -hmm. it's, almost, it's almost a shock the other way around, right? It's, it's true. God gives you clarity of sight. All right. And also the way in which the eyes look. Mm. Everything changes. There is, a, there is a total decorum change. Mm if the change is affected. Yeah. And that is beautiful. That. that is beautiful. And so it takes a mind shift and it takes a change of heart. It's not easy. So let's be patient. Is mm -hmm. Jesus patient? Oh. <laughs> Long suffering for <clears throat> how many thousands of years already? Okay. So young and old, God is now testing you. So it's not only for the young, but also for the old. Mm -hmm. You are deciding your own eternal destiny, your pride, your love to follow the fashions of the world, your vain and empty conversation, your selfishness are all put on the scale, and the weight of evil is fearfully against you. You are poor and miserable and blind and naked. Martin, this is serious introspection. You know, the pride has to be set aside. So, Martin, if, if we are the people that are on the verge of going through to the kingdom, mm -hmm. then all of these things of the world must be counted as naught. Exactly. Nothing of the world must be holding you back on anything that God wants you to do. All right. Now, once you do this, do you feel deprived? At first, if your mindset is not right, yes, you do. But if your mindset comes right, are you then deprived or are you enriched? Much more enriched than ever you were before. Okay, it's very difficult for people to understand. Don't it you? is, especially if you're standing on the other side. Yes. If, you're, if you hear this and you are new to this whole walk with God, this is, uh, it's not, it it's doesn't not work. It's not easy to swallow. Yeah. Many I saw were flattering themselves that they were good Christians who have not a single ray of light from Jesus. Good Christians not having a single ray of light from Jesus because there's no difference between them and the world. No. They know not what it is to be renewed by the grace of God. They have no living experience for themselves in the things of God. And I saw that the Lord was wetting his sword in heaven to mm. cut them down. Oh, that every cold, lukewarm professor could realize the clean work that God is about to make amongst his professed people. Martin, are we being judgmental by putting these quotes up? The contrary. And that's what this whole lecture is about, or this whole discussion. This is the testimony to the Laodicean church, which we are, like you've mentioned before. Yes. How we deal with this will determine on which side we are, where we are. All right, so it's, it's very important that we don't divide this discussion into them and us. 100%. This it's is never us. them, it's always us. us. 
like Daniel, when he prayed and he asked for forgiveness, he didn't say they, he said he means included in that whole we prayer. Have we have sinned. Listen. All right, Martin, let's look at the statements for young Sabbath keepers. I saw that the young do not take the burden nor feel the responsibility of the cause of God. Is it because God has excused them? Oh, no, I saw that they excuse themselves. They are eased and others are burdened. They do not realize that they are not their own. Now, when you take uh, the way in which God worked in the past, did he bypass the young or did he target them? He targeted them. His disciples, how old were they? Young, young, young. I mean, 17 years mm -hmm. old. Yeah, they were young, right? Even if you go back, uh, <clears throat> Daniel, Joseph, all of these that stood for God, and oh, then yeah. you come to the pioneers of this of our church. But they were they were minorities. Right? Yeah, always the always, remnant. Always minorities. So this is not a blanket accusation against the young. This is a state of mind that is prevalent amongst the young. Yes, and it's a wake up call. So if this talks to you, change. So many of the young I saw have not the spirit of Jesus. The love of God is not in their hearts. Therefore, all the natural besetments hold the victory instead of the spirit of God and salvation. It is the lack of religion, lack of holy living that makes the young backward. Do you all right? Lack of religion. That's not understanding the issues. Yes, not a lack of knowledge of religion. A no. lack of religion In applying. Other words, living what you know. Yes. yes. A lack of the holy living that makes the young backwards. A holy living means living in the will of God. Mm. That means your language is clean. Yeah. That means what goes into the mouth is clean. Mm -hmm. That means what comes out of the mouth is clean. That means your decorum is clean. Mm. And if it's not, then you go backwards. Yeah. Their life condemns them. They know that they do not live as Christians should. Therefore, they have not confidence towards God or before the church. Now, when you and I, well, not me, I wasn't living in rebellion. Mm. I was rebellion. Yeah. Because I didn't know the truth. Mm. But if you know the truth, mm. like my son, for example, he knew the truth, but he chose a life of rebellion. Yeah. And then when he had to come back, or when the call came to him, come back, it was very hard for him. And in the beginning, it was a burden. He knew he had to do it, but his, his system rebelled against it. Exactly. Until that which you do becomes better than that which you did. Yes. And God takes hold of you, and even what you like, <clears throat> like you mentioned before, what I used to like, I now dislike. And what yes. I used to dislike, I now... Right. So I want to say to the youth, you must get to the point where that which you love, you hate. Yeah. And In that which you hated, you now love. Yeah. In the world. The world leaders. It's, 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 it's... Yeah. It, mindset change. What did you say? Hard. Cognitive dissonance. All right. And, and does peer pressure prevent you from doing it? Oh, completely. Because that's where Satan works best. And this can also be applied to people that are new to the truth. Yes. So young Sabbath keepers are young of age and also people that are young in getting the truths of the Bible. Yeah. Martin, isn't it a lot easier to speak about doctrine and truth and error and things and what's happening in the world than speaking about these things. It's much easier. <laughs> much easier, right? <laughs> yes, because this has to work on our hearts as well. Yes. So how little do the young suffer or deny self for their religion? To sacrifice is scarcely thought of amongst them. They, they entirely fail of imitating the pattern in this respect. I saw that this was the language of their lives. Self must be gratified. Pride must be indulged. They forget the man of sorrows who was acquainted with grief. It's a hard choice because 
Why do you want to do this? Why do you want to walk the path of sorrows if you can walk the path of exaltation? <laughs> and why do it, it, it always have to be so um, different? Yes. <laughs> now, why was he a man of sorrows? He was a man of sorrows because he knew what was right, but he also knew that nobody wanted it. Yeah. And that made him sorrowful, sorrowful. Mm. because he also knew that if you didn't want it, you didn't qualify for heaven. That's, uh, he knew that's why he was sorrowful. Okay, so in heaven, yeah. where everybody does the will of God, is he a man of sorrow? No, he's a man of jubilation. Ah. <laughs> so is it possible to change from a man of sorrows to a man of jubilation? Yes. And you can do it here as well. I want these to be where I am also. Yeah. I want them there. And when they are there, he looks at the travail and he says, it was worth it. It was worth it. And we will say, heaven was cheap enough. Heaven was cheap enough. So, Martin, uh, if you have this concept of long-faced Christianity... A life of toil and misery. Then you will choose the world. That's what happened to Martin Luther. Because when he was a monk, that is the life you have. It's misery and you, 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 you can't be saved. And when he discovered... But he that, wanted to go to heaven, so he chose to rather go through the suffering exactly. as a monk. Exactly. But then he discovered the man of sorrows. And his, his whole... Life changed. Okay, so we have to define why he is a man of sorrows. I think we've done it. Yeah. He is a man of sorrows because he knows the consequences of sin and he knows the choices that people make that make him sorrowful. It's like a parent mm. that sees his child going the wrong way mm. and he becomes sorrowful. And when he sees him going the right way, he becomes Joyful. joyful. Exactly. So, in heaven, the man of joy will be Christ. Yes. And those that have followed him will be the children of joy. joy. So, don't look at the way in which the world is running now. Yeah. Keep your eyes focused on the future. The sufferings of Jesus in Gethsemane, he's sweating, as it were, great drops of blood in the garden, the plaited crown of thorns that pierced his holy brow, do not move them. They have become benumbed, their sensibilities are blunted, they have lost all sense of the great sacrifice for them. They don't want to go there. No. They don't want to go there, and least of all do they want to follow there. Want a life of ease, according to the world. Yes. Because otherwise, you've always got somebody, oh, why are you like this? Why did you, like you mentioned before, you, it seems like you're always deprived of everything in life. Yes. Everything that's fun is gone. Those only who have partaken of the suffering of the Son of God and have come up through the great tribulation, have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb, can enjoy the indescribable glory and unsurpassed beauty of heaven. Is there something positive on the other side? Yes, oh, something unsurpassed. Now, there's a song which says, I'm a pilgrim, mm -hmm. right? And uh, you're a pilgrim in this, this sad world. Let's, let's say uh, you have a nuclear apocalypse mm. and you're walking through this nuclear apocalypse. There's a lot of sadness on the left and on the right and people bleeding and people dying of radiation sickness. and Basically, that's the state we are in. Yeah, the world is. The world is in that state. And if this is your world, then it's a rather sad place to be because it's not going to improve. Yeah. It's going to go from bad to worse. But if your focus is on the unsurpassed beauty of heaven, not only physically but character-wise then all of those things which you counted of such great value are actually meaningless. But speaking those words, for somebody that hasn't realized this yet, that's, it doesn't, 
you have to get to that that words get meaning to you okay now let's take a little round object about this size and a net mm. and your ability of your foot to kick this little round object into that net that is the whole tenor of your life mm. on a scale of 1 to 10 how important is that compared to what is available Z zero. Zero, right? Mm. But people make it their entire life. Exactly. They live it, they eat it, they drink it, they spend all their money mm. on it. And what does it bring you in the end that you were able, with your foot, to take the round object and put it in a net? Maybe you only get a little certificate or a small idol that <laughs> acknowledges that you were good. But that's... If it, there's a distant memory of you after a while. I imagine the whole universe being open to you. You're being able to go anywhere in the universe, study the depth of the universe, mm. understand mm. how everything is put together. Everything that man strives for never achieves. We're, we live on theories, don't we? Yeah. And the next generation will pro prove your theory wrong. Yeah. So you actually lived a lie. Is it worth it no. to lose eternal life for the sake of a lie? Let's take evolution. Yeah. Are evolutionists willing to forego eternal life for the sake of a lie? No. Oh, yeah. yes, they are. Yes. Yeah. Yes, they are, right? Yes. Okay. So, Martin, we don't have a perception of heaven. No, because otherwise you, that will be where your focus is. Okay. So, Martin, if we don't have a perception of heaven, would we want to prepare for it? No. That brings us to the next point. The want of this necessary preparation will shut out the greatest portion of young professors, for they will not labor earnestly and zealously enough to obtain that rest that remains for the people of God. I saw that Jesus was now giving them opportunity to confess, to repent in deep humility and purify their lives by obeying and living the truth. I saw that now was the time for wrongs to be righted, sins to be confessed, or appear before the sinner in the day of God's wrath. So your sins will either catch up with you or you will be able to get rid of them by following the prescribed course. Mm. In terms of what the world offers you, not a choice that everybody is willing to make. And when it says young professors, this doesn't have to be a young person. No. It can be a new convert. Yeah. Jacob-like, wrestle in prayer, agonize. Jesus in the garden, sweat great drops of blood. You must make an effort. Do not leave your closet until you feel strong in God. Then watch. And just as long as you watch and pray, you can keep these evil besetments under and the grace of God can and will appear in you. They will call you a nerd. Yeah, or a Jesus freak or something, you know. Okay. I saw that the Christian should not set too high a value nor depend too much upon a happy flight of feeling. These feelings are not always true. I saw that it should be the study of every Christian to serve God from principle and not be ruled by feeling. Is Satan a master at creating religious emotion? Oh, for sure. I think he's the master of entertainment. Uh -huh. So when you go to church, are you going there for a flight of feeling? Are you going there to be entertained? Are you going there for a rush? Or... Are you going there to spend time with God and allowing the Holy Spirit to work on you? You see, that's where Satan is a very good deceiver. Because the world is so feeling-based. He wants young people, or most people, want to feel the same when they get into church. Okay. And obviously... You have to put it in perspective now. Is that what God wants? Because otherwise God's boring until you get the, your, your mindset right on that portion. 
Okay, so God is ev actually everything but boring. Yeah. So the problem is really the mindset. <clears throat> That's it. I was shown that if the Christian lives a humble, self-sacrificing life to God, Peace and joy in the Lord will be the result. But the greatest happiness experienced will be in doing others good, in making others happy. Such happiness will be lasting. <laughs> it's the opposite of the world's thinking. Yeah, completely. So even the philanthropists of the world today mm. are showing this great generosity actually to exalt themselves. themselves. So as, as soon as you move this do the shift from yourself to somebody else, then you will be truly happy. But that's opposite of what the world tells you. You must believe in yourself. You must do your best. You, you know, must follow your heart. Follow your heart. That it's only you, you, you the whole time. But the heart is desperately wicked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Above all things. I saw that some would have to walk the straight path alone. Their companions and children will not walk the self-denying pathway with them. That makes it even harder. Huh? Yeah. Patience and forbearance should characterize the lives of those lone pilgrims, following the example of their blessed master. He eventually walked totally alone. Yeah. They all forsook him. All Didn't the Bible him. say all forsook yeah. him? They'll have many trials to endure, but they have a hope that makes the soul strong. The only way that you can survive this kind of situation. Let's say you're in a marriage relationship mm. where the one just absolutely refuses to follow this path mm. and you follow it, which means that you have zero joy. Yeah. The only way you can survive it is if you provide joy for others. Perfect. Perfectly it, put, yeah. Only way you can survive it. That's the it. only way. So if you see the joy in other people's faces that accept it, it can help you get over the sadness of those that don't accept exactly. it. Exactly. They're very well put. But if your companions and your children will not come, if you cannot win them to yield to the claims of truth, make their lives here as pleasant as possible, for all they will ever enjoy will be this poor world. But let not your duty to them interfere with your duty towards God. So the advice that we have here is put your heart and soul into the work. Yes. See the results of your work from the outside and you will receive a joy that surpasses all understanding. So if your focus is on the right place, you can bear all these other things. Yes. And the way that you should bear it is still in a godly manner. Yes, and you must retain your cheerfulness. Yes, and your um, compassion. And pray that your cheerfulness will be contagious to those that oppose you. Yeah. Even though they probably will get angry if you are cheerful, if they no. are trying their best to be miserable. The more you do God's will, the more agitation you will get from the world. All right, Martin, that brings us to another point. If you want to be happy... In the Laodicean church, then put your shoulder to the wheel, yes. do God's work, do the work of the ministry, and don't fight all of these things within because you will not succeed in changing them. No, don't go and take this testimony that we've just read and bash people over the head with it. No, you can't. No, it's an individual work for themselves to work out. Correct. Okay. So again, to our story, you're standing on the wall of Zion with your face looking at the world out there, looking for the enemy to come, and looking for those that you can possibly reach with a message. Mm, mm. That brings joy. Exactly. Facing the church mm -hmm. and trying to fix the church brings misery. For sure. As we near the judgment, all will manifest their true character and it will be made plain to what company they belong. The sieve is going. Let us not say, stay thy hand, O God, we know not the heart of man. The church must be purged and will be. So there will be a shaking. Yes. Now if we go to the Laodicean church, in the beginning, the pioneers didn't think that the message applied to them. Mm. 
they thought it applied to the nominal churches that weren't accepting the truth, the yeah, commandments yeah. of God and the testimony of Jesus, right? And then they were thoroughly shocked when they realized that it applied to them. Yes, then this Laodicean testimony um, came yes. and said, no, you guys better and some of them, up. And some of them said, but, you know, here are they that keep the commandments. We are mm -hmm. the ones that are keeping the commandments. Therefore, we are righteous with God. We cannot be Laodicea. Yeah. And then came the message of righteousness by faith. Yes, 1888. And when you accept the message of righteousness by faith, then where are your works? Secondary. Secondary. Yeah. So everything that you boasted about yourself becomes <laughs> meaningless. Exactly. Does that mean you mustn't keep the commandments? No. They were too much on that side. Come a little bit, come back into the middle. All right. So the entire church just about split. Mm. Including presidents and leaders within the church, and they fought against this message tooth and nail. Because just think about it your righteousness is all of a sudden removed. <laughs> you have none. That which you thought, <clears throat> okay, this made that I am okay. Yes, it's gone. <laughs> it's <laughs> carpet pulled right from under you, the rug. All right, so all your works are now filthy rags. That must have been quite a blow to them. Mm -hmm. And it took some of them a long time, and some of them never, never. got there, mm. to accept this. But unfortunately, as in most of history, history has a tendency to repeat itself. And it will repeat itself mm. in our time. So Martin, when you are purged, it is because of self-righteousness. Yes. It's self-righteousness that has to be purged out of you. Either I'm good enough because I keep the commandments, mm -hmm. or God will accept me like I am. Yeah. One of the two. You're either on that one or on the other side. So in the spring of 1857, I accompanied my husband to the, on a tour of the East. His principal business was to purchase the power press. We held conferences on our way to Boston and on our return. This was a discouraging tour. The testimony to the Laodicean church was generally received, but some in the East were making bad use of it. Instead of applying it to their own hearts so as to be benefited by it themselves, they were using the testimony to oppress others. So this that's not a test, <laughs> not the case anymore, right? No, that's a, you see, so <clears throat> like we mentioned before, this testimony that we just read was for every individual in the church, in our church, in yes. us. It's us, yes. But then what happens? Exactly the same happens. You use today. it as a bashing tool. A few taught that the brethren must sell all out before they could be free, while some others dwelt much upon dress, carrying the subject to an extreme. And with a few others, there was a narrowing of the work of the third message and following of impressions and casting fear upon the conscientious. These things have had a blighting influence and have caused us to lay down our testimony on the subject almost entirely. So if it causes so much turmoil, don't speak about it. And that's what happens then it goes to the other side again. Okay, does that mean it's not truth? No, it is truth. So the design of the message to the Laodiceans was to rid the church of just such fanatical influences, but it actually did the opposite. Yeah. Because it doesn't apply to me. Mm. That means self-righteousness, right? Yeah. If you take the testimony <clears throat> and you want to apply to everybody else, you're going to have the same problem that, that they, you have to apply to you. But the effort of Satan has been to corrupt the message and destroy its influence. He would be better pleased to have fanatical persons embrace the testimony and use it in his cause than to have them remain in a lukewarm state. So he wants bashers. Yeah. Do we have bashers in the church? Unfortunately, we do. Okay. And do we have people that say, my way or the highway? Yes. 
If you don't do it exactly like I think it should be done, then you have no right in this organization. But there's a little bit of a twist because of not a twist, a problem. Because there's testimonies that they use to justify why they're saying it. Okay. But they misapply it because the testimony is also applicable to the person giving it. The testimonies was never given to a person to go impl implement it on somebody else. No, it's just a testimony. It's a testimony from God as to the state of the church. And to you. Yes. Us. Because you are part of the church. I'm part of the church. I've seen that it was not the design of the message to lead brother to sit in judgment over his brother, to tell him what to do and just how far to go, for, but for each individual to search his own heart and attend to his own individual work. It is the work of the angels to watch the development of character and weigh moral worth. This is the message to the Laodiceans. So this is how we should approach <clears throat> this whole message. And through this, the, we can also touch on unity. Because can you get unity as we are supposed to, uh, like um, Jesus prayed? If one group thinks you are fanatical and the other one group thinks you totally off the course liberal, there's no unity. There cannot be a, a <clears throat> unity. So if we look at Romans, where it says, in honor preferring one another, then there is to be no unkind criticism, no pulling to pieces of another's work, and there are to be no separate parties. Every man to whom the Lord has entrusted a message has his specific work, each one has an individuality of his own, which he is not to sink into that of any other man, yet each is to work in harmony with his brethren. In their service, God's workers are to be essentially one. No one is to set himself up as a criterion, speaking disrespectfully of his fellow workers or tra treating them as inferior. Martin, if this spirit doesn't exist in the church... I get so many messages from people that say they want to leave the church. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is what they use. Exactly. And some of them, if they want to do what is right, they feel that they are the targets. Mm -hmm. And this is the church militant. It's going to have those two parties in it. And only those on whom the Laodicean message has actually worked. Yes. Oh, wow. Well. Mm. We'll be part of the final remnant. That, that is unfortunately how it is. That's the criteria. And I don't know who's going to be. No. Me and you, all of us, that's why we, yeah, like you said, we, not they, yes. have to take the Laodicean message and apply it to my own. Yes, we have to think about it in terms of ourselves, not in terms of the others. That's it. And then work with your <clears throat> brothers. Leave the rest to God. All right. Now, if you... You think that you've studied this through and you've decided you know, you're going to do this right and you're going to be perfect and you're going to strive for the sinlessness. Mm. Then eventually pride can come in and you can say, well, this is achievable. And the fact of the matter is it is. Mm. But you may not have the element of pride attached to it because then you become judgmental. Right? You have, uh, who else, who, who show how this is done except Jesus? Yes. Nobody. So the claim to be sinless, Martin, this is such an important one. There's a wonder-working power to appear, and it will be when men are claiming sanctification and holiness, lifting themselves up higher and higher and boasting of themselves. Can you see the pride element? Oh, for sure. That's Look at Moses and the prophets. Look at Daniel and Joseph and Elijah. Look at these men and find me one sentence where they ever claim to be sinless. The very soul that is in close relation to Christ, beholding his purity and excellence, see, will fall before him with shamefacedness. So I will never be inclined to say I'm sinless, I'm holy. Let God write it in his book if he wants to. He can do it. He can decide that, but not me. No. I must also classify myself like Daniel with the we. 
have sinned. We have sinned. None of us are perfect. So here again, pride comes into the issue. So when we look at Daniel, who had great skill, he did not say, Lord, I've been very faithful to you and I've done everything to honor you and defend your word and name. Did he do those things? No, not at all. Oh, they, they do it in his yeah, life. Yeah. Yes. Yes, he 100%. did it in his life, but he never said it. He said it, yeah. Lord, you know how faithful I was at the king's table and how I maintained my integrity when they cast me into the den of lions. Was that the way Daniel prayed to God? No. He prayed and confessed his sins and said, Hear, O Lord, and deliver, and we have departed from thy word and have sinned. But Laodicea seems to say, Yes, but, you know, we're a special generation. Yes. We're not like them. We are, we're going to achieve something higher than they did. No. There's going to be a new way of salvation. It can't, no. cannot because God never changed. And exactly, let's put it bluntly, the 144,000 will not be, <clears throat> in the end, any different from what Adam and Eve had to attain. Because God's, Jesus' righteousness will be over them. Yes. And even Joshua, the high priest, in that, that uh, story of Jesus facing Satan, said, uh, remove his filthy robes mm. and put a fair mitre on his head. So this is our state, whether we like it or whether we don't like mm. it. And as it says over here, you know, Jesus had to come to him in the appearance of a man. He would not have been able to stand in the presence of God. So why is it that so many claim to be holy and sinless? It is because they are so far from Christ. I've never dared to claim any such thing from the time I was 14 years old. If I knew what the will of God was, I was willing to do it. You never have heard me say I'm sinless. Those that get a sight of the loveliness and exalted character of Jesus Christ, who was holy and lifted up and his train fills the temple, will never say it. Yet we are to meet with those that will say such things more and more. We have so many forums that seem to push this angle constantly. If they were concerned about saving souls out there and partaking in the work that the Lord has given them, they would be examples for people to follow. You see... The more you study the spirit of prophecy along with the Bible, the more you realize when you are busy with the work, the other things will start sorting itself out. But when you're focused only on those things, then that's where you end up with. Yes, and your focus is within. That's it. That's immediately where the problem lies, when your focus is in, within. So we need to be refined, cleansed from all earthliness till we reflect the image of our Savior and become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. This you have to do. Yeah. But once you say, I've done it, <laughs> you've lost it. You've lost it. And once you want to bash everybody else to do this, you've got the same problem. Jesus has to do that work. That's the Holy Spirit's work. Oh, Holy Spirit. But we shall not boast of our holiness. We cannot say I'm sinless till this vile body is changed and fashions like unto his glorious body. But if we constantly seek to follow Jesus, the blessed hope is ours of standing before the throne of God without spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, completing Christ robed in his righteousness and perfection. So Martin, have you been changed into his glorious body? No. Not yet. Not yet. So, Martin, are you, can you say you are sinless? <laughs> no, I'm blind and wretched and naked. Does that mean that you have to carry on sinning? No. How do you get <laughs> that across? You walk after, right behind Jesus, and you don't, you're not the judge. So, Martin, can we say that Jesus is walking in front of us? Mm hmm. He's walking in the middle of the path where justice and mercy meet. Yeah. Isn't no. that where we should walk? Exactly the same place. We are to follow exactly behind him, not wavering to the left, where we proclaim that his love covers all, but we neglect the necessity to obey. Mm. That's the one extreme. 
Neither should we waver to the right from behind him, where we stand as a policeman to constantly correct our brothers and sisters. And in both cases, we might seem to still be following, but we are off the path. So is that the message to the Laodiceans? That is the message. It's an individual message to you, to me, me. Is it the message of the righteousness of Christ? Yes. All right. Whose righteousness? Christ's righteousness. Are you sure? Yes. Nobody else. Not mine. So uh, let's say that you received the righteousness of Christ. Whose have you received? The, he is. He is. Yeah, he is. <laughs> no. All right. So where does that give you the right to say that you are righteous? <laughs> None. Zero. There's Zero. no. You don't have any right to do that. Okay. That's very discouraging. No, if it's we, actually encouraging because then you don't have to be discouraged when you don't, it, can't do it. <laughs> okay. Psalms 89 verse 14. Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. When we study the divine character in the light of the cross, we see mercy, tenderness, forgiveness, blending with equi equity and justice. Do we see condemnation, harshness, any one of those attributes? None. So do we see an intolerance to the failures of others? Yes. Yes, we do. That's what we see, right? Yes. We are constantly... Intolerant. All right. Mustn't we encourage people oh. rather than condemn? Bring with love the truth. What did Jesus say? Oh. Neither do I condemn, condemn you. Did he condemn the sin? Yes. Ah. For sure. Ah, he condemned the sin. Yeah. Not the person. We see in the midst of the throne one bearing in his hands and feet and sight the marks of the suffering endured to reconcile man to God. We see a father infinite dwelling in light unapproachable yet receiving us to himself through the merits of his son. The cloud of vengeance that threatened only misery and despair in the light reflected from the cross reveals the writings of God. Live, sinner, live. Ye penitent, believing souls, live, I have paid a ransom. So Martin, the only boasting that we have is boasting in Christ. Yes, the only boasting that we have is that Christ has done all for me, and at least I can claim that for myself. So I can account all the rest as rubbish? Yes. Is that what Paul said? Yeah. So mercy and truth are met together, righteousness and peace have kissed each other. While you seek to administer justice, remember that she has a twin sister, which is mercy. Isn't this a beautiful statement? <laughs> it's amazing. Hey? Because Why we do always, we always separate them? Yeah, we always forget it. We, we just walk with one sister. <laughs> okay, so we have justice on the one side and mercy on the other side. That's it. The two stand side by side and should not be separated. So I think our picture here is... Actually, quite to the point. We cannot go through the gate if we don't follow right behind Jesus. So, with that verse in mind, or that statement in mind, I think we can conclude the Laodicean message. It's a personal message. It's a message which lays the emphasis on the righteousness of Christ. It's an emphasis which lays self into the dust. It is a, a message of following and mm -hmm. not running ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's a message of not deviating from the footsteps that went before you. Amen. Right? Amen. We should make it personal and then get that same attitude and the love that Christ has for people. He never walked around condemning and when we accept it, mm. we can become part of that remnant that will bring the loud cry. Amen. And we have to talk about that also in the future. Let's <laughs> pray. Heavenly Father, the message to the Laodiceans is not one that sits well with humanity. It goes against the fallen nature. 
it puts our existence, our lives into perspective. Accepting the Laodicean message is not conducive to man's plans of being somebody and something. But in heaven's plan, it makes them something and someone. So help us, Lord, to do that introspection, study our lives, see if we are in harmony with the word, and ask God to change us into his similitude. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.